Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Schwartz, and I'm a member engagement and marketing manager for the ABC Commissioning Group. Thank you for joining us for the third installment of ACG's Essential Commissioning webinar series. Every month for the rest of 2020, we'll be hosting a new presentation covering different facets of the commissioning process. These webinars are endorsed by CABA, the Continental Automated Buildings Association, and this particular session is sponsored by Ebtron. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes before we get started today. We encourage you to submit questions at any time using the Q&A button on the bottom part of the player. A few will be selected to answer at the end of the webinar and any remaining questions will be answered by the speakers afterward. The chat function is where you can make general comments and chat with attendees. If you happen to be experiencing any technical problems during the webinar, please use the chat function to inform the panelists. Finally, in terms of continuing education credit, you will receive an email after the webinar with instructions on how to get your proof of attendance using ACG's CX Energy app. Today's webinar is Indoor Air Quality in the COVID Era, Commissioning and Construction Considerations with Raj Seti and Mike Wolf. Raj is currently president of a full service mechanical, electrical and plumbing consulting engineering firm located in Washington, DC with six offices specializing in institutional projects, energy modeling, commissioning, and high performance buildings. He is also on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force for schools. Mike is a principal at Farnsworth Group and has over 12 years of commissioning experience involving multiple market sectors, predominantly education, healthcare, manufacturing, and municipal. Mike is working with a range of clients from large organizations to rural hospitals to contractors on solutions to make their buildings safer during this current crisis. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to our presenters to kick us off today. All right. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you out there. This is going to be the table of contents to go over the virus transmission, just giving you some facts about viruses. Then. Um, some of my work on the ASHRAE task force and the epidemic task force moving from guidelines into is it working and then how are we starting to make adjustments and then looking at some of the emerging tech out there. A uh, little bit about SETI, we are headquartered out of Washington DC, we work across the nation, um, so we have been working heavily on the COVID uh, retrofits and getting buildings reopened in the last uh, few months. Mike? Yeah, a little bit about Farnsworth. We're a national architecture engineering firm, uh, really working with full service solutions for our clients with, you know, trying to find uh, ways to get around uh, virus transmission and uh, those type of solutions. Okay, so let's get educated on some of the virus basics. Where are we going to get the guidance that we're looking for. So CDC just this week finally came around and said that the virus is airborne. ASHRAE has taken the position almost eight months ago at this point <clears throat> that the virus is sufficiently likely to move through the air. So all of the guidance has been going down that path. You're gonna have your three main tools, ventilation, disinfection, and filtration. And within all those, you have different strategies. So the virus that is on everyone's mind right now is the SARS COVID virus. <clears throat> this is going to be in that 10 micron range. It is an enveloped virus, which is the easiest to kill, which is the good news. So when we do talk about filtration, this is where the genesis of the filtration uh, mesh sizes come from. How do we pick up the particulate that will that is carrying the viruses? How can we filter those? Mike? Yeah, and so looking at a little bit of the CDC guidelines uh, and recent guidance and research, um, I wanted to show these charts because it does show that fomite transmission is a bit of a less, less of a concern than airborne transmission. And this is really consistent with that ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols. You can see in those charts that, you know, that incubation time by about four days uh, the viability of that viral load is, is pretty much gone um, and it, that it is exacerbated and increases uh, degradation with temperature and humidity. What a lot of our clients are asking is where are the studies for this? The studies are now 
coming out and it's taken time to get them peer reviewed, but they are coming out and this is where this guidance is adjusting to more of an aerosolized approach versus surface disinfection. So this is another chart just kind of giving you some relative sizes um, as you are conveying it to your clients about particulate, particulate matter, and all of this, even in consideration of the indoor air quality out west, is going to be talking more and more about air quality. And part of getting educated in this presentation is that you have to get familiar with particulates, particulate size, filtration techniques. Mike? Yeah, and really, again, looking at the latest research out there and the aerodynamics, uh, probably many of you recognize this chart that we have on the slide deck here, in, and that is really from the ASHRAE position paper again. Um, looking at the size of the virus that, in, that Raj just showed, you can see that this can stay airborne for a number of hours, really between that 12 to 41 hours. So um, we're, we're really looking at, um, you know, what that research is showing on the left, you know, talking about some of the studies done about different activities and what those mean size particles uh, that are produced in those activities like talking, coughing, sneezing. So again, just as commissioning um, and practitioner standpoint, we need to just be aware of this research. So the other piece of information that I'd, we'd like you to take away from this is the word quanta. So this is the generation of viral particles. And later on the presentation, we're gonna go over the different factors that uh, impact the probability of getting infection. Right now, ASHRAE has six air changers between six and 12. They have not settled, excuse me, they have not settled on that number yet. Uh, for practitioners' purposes, in, in our industry, in my practice, we are starting with six air changes as a starting point. As you can see from the chart on the left, the quanta is going to be per time. So as a sick person is generating these viral load particles, then it is very difficult to keep up with it once you start reaching certain thresholds with time. So it is very important that you remember the time element and the number of quanta that people are generating. But this is where you start seeing the six air changes, typically in ORs, in uh, more of the healthcare, you'll see anywhere the guidance is 10 to 15 air changes. So this is where this originates from. You're going to see this now famous Chinese um, restaurant. So part of this as practitioners is start thinking about the uh, diffuser circulation and the distribution of your air diffusers and also your return air paths. So the table on the right, A1, if you haven't heard about this Chinese um, study, that was the first person that was sick. It was no one at table E tested positive, but that was the distribution of the positive tests, and they correlated this directly back to the diffusers. So when you get questions on partitions, when you start getting questions on masks, partitions and masks definitely stop that first initial burst, uh, but you have to start to take it into context with your air distribution. So in some of our cases, we are recommending putting return air grills directly above occupants in offices. And that way we're giving some level of laminar flow um, up and out of the building. So start thinking about that as you create your OPRs and uh, functional performance tests. All right. I wanted to, yeah, and I wanted to just show this video here. Um, I know many of you may have actually been in the Price Laboratory and seen this study done uh, or this test being done with using a smoke canister. Uh, you can see that at 100% airflow, about 350 CFM, uh, it's just a reminder of how well these diffusers mix the air, which is great in uh, non-pandemic times, but when you start thinking about airflow and using airflow as a way to mitigate virus transmission, which is, again, what that ASHRAE position document talks about, uh, we need to just be aware of what that airfl airflow looks like. Another consideration, too, from a practitioner standpoint and I'll be talking about this later, but how do we rethink the commissioning process? You know, what do, 
what do our functional tests look like now when safety is a primary concern? Um, this is one way, you know, using smoke tests like this, that I think would be a creative way to start to validate um, that risk of, of virus transmission. So all of these, as we continue to go through the discussion on <clears throat> uh, the influence of all these is, we as practitioners and commissioning agents, we may be pulled into an era of bio commissioning for lack of a better term. So not just with energy has been the forefront of how we've been uh, gauged and graded, but now is it actually working? And when we say working, is it, are we slowing down this transmission uh, of the virus? So part of this is humidity. There are no good studies currently about the level of humidity and coronavirus. However, there are good studies with the um, influenza A virus and in percent infectivity. So between 40 and 60%, there is a reduction in the percent infectivity. Now, we can't apply this universally, but building operators should have the ability to adjust their humidity levels uh, to help mitigate the transmission. So that's kind of where you want to start thinking about that as you start guiding your clients. Uh, I did want to just, sorry, I forgot to do a poll. If we can just go ahead and do that poll now. So we'll have about uh, 10 seconds and you can just click your answers. Okay, so this is a good um, segue. As you start to think about, you know, you can see the results. None of us really have, even in the healthcare environment, the way we are gauged typically for us is air change rates. And um, even when we do an operating room as a design engineer, we don't have a test to see if there's still any bacteria, bacteria, mold, viruses in that OR after we are gauged by air change rates. So they could, this could change in the future. All right, so filtration. So this is already out there. Um, teachers unions have kind of leech, uh, latched on to filtration as one of their first levels of protection. So where does the number MERV 13 come from? That is the um, recommendation from the task force for the filtration of particulate size. Remember that filters are dynamic, they're not static. So you get higher particulate efficiency with different particulates and with different filters. So the graph on the right shows you between that MERV 14 and 16, as the particles start to get smaller, you start to approach that 80% of filter efficiency. And then you can see the same graph or the table on the left is about the efficiency and where you're trying to target. So there are gonna be downsides to changing the filters, but new designs as you start writing new OPRs should have a minimum of MERV 13. And also think about the passes and air change rates. So this is where we get to that delta between uh, MERV 13 and HEPA. Luckily, LEED has been uh, mandating MERV 13, so many modernized buildings do have that at this point. Mike? Yeah, kind of this slide just really affirms what Raj said about MERV 13 really hits that sweet spot. You can see here that risk of infection. You know, one of the studies here cited on the, the bottom of the slide looks at actual risk of infection by the flu virus, which like Raj pointed out is a comparable that we can think about when we're thinking about COVID. A lot of these studies were of course done before uh, 2019, but you can see that really at MERV 13 that starts to flatten out the effectiveness. Um, and I think, Raj, if you go to the next slide, we have a slide on the costs. Oh, maybe we... The effects. Yeah. There, there's also a, a correlation, as many of you are probably aware, of the cost of filtration then. And, you know, looking at the increased static pressure for those higher level filters um, and making sure that, you know, we're finding that balance for our clients. So when we talk about the filtration, I want everyone to always apply common sense. So we are changing the filters. If we do have a degradation in motor horsepower, 
performance from temperature, then we go back to the previous filter and the next filter changes. Because occupancy is so varied right now, we're generally not seeing full loads on any of our buildings, any types. So that's kind of part of it. Electrostatic, uh, otherwise known as corona discharge or electrostatic precipitators, this is a technology that in essence charges the particles. And you'll have a couple different ways where it charges the particles. Either the particles are positive and negative and they stick to each other, and that is called agglomeration, or the particles have a positive and then the filtration media has a negative and then they adhere there. So this is also bipolar ionization and uh, a couple other different technologies in the general category of corona discharge. This is a great technology if you cannot change your filters, especially in those very small terminal units, PTACs, heat pumps, VAVs. Um, it does improve your filtration. However, there is no correlation saying I have a MERV-8 filter, I will do a uh, bipolar ionization and I get a MERV-11. So there are no peer-reviewed studies stating that, they're all manufactured data. The other piece is we are looking at the ASHRAE um, guidance of air changes per hour of anywhere from six to 10 based on your risk. So in a nurse's suite on a school, you might wanna move that up to 10. On a typical corridor classrooms, you can be at six, but the ultimate guidance is gonna be left up to the different designers and uh, practitioners. Six air changes, we would like to see all of the air see a filter, get diluted, or get disinfected every 10 minutes. And when you see things, when your manufacturer literature comes out and says we're at 99.9% .9 of a kill rate, that is based on typically an hour of runtime. So you're going to see the multiple passes. It also is not based on the increase of quanta. So as you're seeing from the image below, as someone breathes, they're continually generating the infectious particles. So that has to be taken into consideration when you are thinking of your uh, kill rate. Ventilation standards, uh, there is no relaxation in the code requirements as dictated by ASHRAE. What we are looking at is you can increase your ventilation systems up to 100% as long as you do not uh, compromise the thermal comfort and then increase uh, moisture or humidity to the space. So your mandate is always do no harm, but introduce more fresh air. The simplest way at times is to run your systems longer and use temporal. So if you're running them an extra hour, an extra two hours after, the uh, occupancy that is allowing the classrooms, the offices to catch up. We're also running it between classes and that allows the no more, that allows zero quanta generation and the HVAC system to start to catch up and perform its dilution and filtration tasks. Mike? Yeah, and I know that a common question that I typically see from our clients is, you know, what is the cost? What's the energy impact? I think we're all wired, especially as commissioning professionals, um, we're wired to be thinking about optimizing that building. We're trained to reduce energy costs. You know, those tend to be our primary objectives. You know, maybe we look at maintainability, constructability, but you know, when it comes to increasing outdoor air, a lot of times this, it goes, is, is intu intuitive um, to our gut instinct. And so I think knowing where some of this research lies um, in this study here, they actually charted out some increases in uh, ventilation energy costs that correspond to outdoor air ventilation rates. Uh, again, we've cited these sources, so you can go look them up um, and, and dig in a little bit deeper into the, the research. I think the other important thing is it is going to be very difficult to not use more energy if we are going to use more fresh air. It's just going to be part of it during this pandemic mode. Okay, there's a couple other technologies you're going to hear about out there. UVC ultraviolet radiation has been used to kill mold on coils for decades. Remember, it needs to be in the UVC at 253.7 nanometers wavelength. 
UVB, UVB, UVA, um, all can be used. However, uh, UVB generates ozone and 253.7 nanometers is the best um, germicidal wavelength. Couple things to watch for is if you see any piece of equipment with UVC and you can see that blue light, then that is not safe. And so as you're a practitioner, make sure that it is either has a safety if it's inside an air handling casing that cuts it, or if it's in a upper room unit, um, you can't look up and see it. You have a lot of light troffer type systems that are being bought and purchased. You have a lot of portable type units that are also being purchased. Uh, as far as the technology on UVC, you have a uh, lamp that's in there. Typically, I believe it's a mercury halide and that gets excited when it gets electrified and the UVC leaves the lamp. And then the lower quality lamps, the um, UVA and UVB also leave. So you want a high quality lamp that absorbs those other wavelengths. So if you get a really cheap product, um, you start to risk the, um, the other bandwidths leaving that particular lamp. Okay, I think we have another poll. Uh, in, in two slides here real quick. Um, but I, I did want to, um, before we jump into that, just talk a little bit about, we're gonna transition the presentation. As you can see, we're trying to interlace sort of that pr practitioner standpoint with the research that's out there uh, around the virus. And thinking about now, how does this actually impact the commissioning process? You know, as practitioners in the field, we're attuned to, you know, implementing this quality process, which we call commissioning. And it's really about mitigating client risks. You know, the risk of a building using too much energy, maybe being difficult to maintain, uh, having high, high life cycle costs, now, what I'm hearing, and I'm sure many of you are, from our clients is asking the question, is our building safe? You know, can, can somebody contract COVID in our facility? So that becomes a, an interesting, I think a higher uh, issue that we as engineers sometimes make us squirm a little bit as how do we break that down? And so really I'd encourage to go back to our tools. You know, one of those tools being the commissioning process. And as you can see on the slide, you know, we know there's some great ASHRAE guidance and standards about new construction commissioning, existing building commissioning, and, and I, you know, we don't have time to go through all the details of that today, but I think to think about not necessarily re redoing that process because of the concerns in this pandemic area, er, era that we're in, but looking at it from a different viewpoint, kind of rethinking how indoor air quality fits into the commissioning process. So. I'm try, trying to break it into maybe three bigger chunks here in the next couple of slides. One being planning, uh, another being assessments, the boots on the ground, and then the ongoing conversations with our clients. So I think this is where the poll comes in. Yep, and, let's do the poll. I think we have two polls, Mike. Yes, we have two, that's right. We'll give you about five more seconds here to uh, click your answer. Okay, good. Well, hopefully by the end we'll have more, but we do need more info, so that's yeah. good. Um, part of the whole first section was talking about just what are we trying to mitigate? So let's see by the end if hopefully we'll get some more. Exactly. Why don't we put up that next poll and flip to the next slide, Raj. This one? Yes. Okay. So let's do the second or the final poll. Give you another few seconds to answer that. Great, let's see what the results are. Okay, yeah, so about 
maybe infrequent. never to infrequently, I'd say about 40% it looks like sometimes frequently. So um, yeah, I, I think we, we have, and, and I'm sure the audience is very mixed here in terms of people that are more on the, the technician side maybe versus uh, commissioning managers. And I think that we can look at this from two different perspectives. You know, that CFR, the current facility requirements and the OPR documents, the owner's project requirements being a tool to help us manage expectations. And this isn't only to better serve the client with a, our deliverable, but I think it's also better to manage our own risks in this. Um, again, just looking at these larger superordinate goals that we often hear from our clients, you know, is my building safe? How can I make my building safe? Um, using the OPR and CFR as a way to, to uh, implement that and manage our risk. Um, one example that I'll give, and you can see on the slide is there's a, uh, we did a risk assessment with a rural hospital. And, uh, you know, a lot of these rural hospitals, revenues are down, they've been hit particularly hard from the pandemic. So making sure that we are providing kind of an incremental model to, you know, implementing the retro commissioning process. So one of the first things we did, though, was actually look at a vulnerability risk assessment with their facility, sat down with the CFO um, and other stakeholders and, and mapped, oh, it's kind of in a green, yellow, red way, uh, the level of risk. And we were able to define that and, and talk about that in, in this context of the owner's project requirements. Um, we also have another case study here where we were working with a, a campus client, about a million and three, um, uh, a million point three uh, square feet and about 16 facilities. And looking at those, those facilities and what, what are the goals here, you know, looking at what's our prioritized list when we go through that many facilities um, and, and in a month and a half time period is what they wanted. So really we boiled that down into the client essentially saying, I want to focus on dilution and filtration. Again, tying directly back to that ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols, you know, and looking at then how do we measure that in the OPR, you know, the dilution being three air change rates of outdoor air and the filtration, they wanted a MERV 13. So this slide just talks a little bit about uh, one tool that you can consider using, uh, and in particular in that OPR CFR conversation. And that's the Wells-Riley equation, which is useful because it gives a higher level metric. You know, a lot of times there are a lot of non-technical executives that are asking questions of us or of the technical owners PM that we're working with. And so we have to deliver and over communicate our results in a, a very non-technical way. And Wells-Riley helps us model that transmission risk. It's a real tangible value. Um, Raj, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the good news is um, if you go to SETI.com, we have taken the Wells-Riley equation and put it into a infection probability tool. So it's a simple spreadsheet. You can put in the square footages. All these factors in here are uh, variables. But what you have to continually tell your client is that we are reducing the probability of infection. Nothing makes it go away. Uh, nothing is 100%. There's no silver bullet. We do know on the hospital design side that from ASHRAE 170 guidelines that that's as hardened as you can get. But if you go to SETI.com and you start playing around with that spreadsheet, you'll see the different factors like time, the pulmonary rate, all of those are built in to give you a predictive tool. From there, you can start to create your projects, your checklists um, to reduce that probability. So that's your simplest uh, OPR. NIST has another good online tool as well that shows particle dispersion. Mm -hmm. And kind of continuing along the commissioning process and how to look at incorporating indoor air quality into this process, uh, a couple of other lessons learned that I want to share. One of them is with this million point three square foot campus that we're working with, um, we found that, you know, this is a great opportunity to utilize those four to five year junior engineers or commissioning technicians where we can have them write IAQ checklists. Um, you may or may not have those in your library of checklists. I'll give a few examples in, in a couple of slides. Uh, but, you know, having them work on those, they can conduct scheme checks while on site. 
you know, where's the outdoor air coming into the air handling unit? What's the arrangement of the coils? Um, is there a, a static pressure switch or a static pressure sensor across the filters? You know, what's that flexibility on site? Having that documented when you have boots on the ground. Um, and then also one other lesson learned that we found was, was good with the assessment portion was making sure that you, you'll find a lot of surprises on site and making sure that you might want to rethink having a tab contractor with you, maybe a controls vendor or the in-house controls professional that uh, an organization may have on staff. So you can kind of take care of all those little issues as you uncover them uh, rather than giving the client a report and then having to take care of them later. When we talk about the ongoing side of things with a client and looking at the commissioning process, the documentation, um, there's often opportunities here to double the value that we can provide to a client. So for example, looking at some of our rural colleges and um, again, rural clients where maybe the budgets are tight, uh, we found that we can start out by doing that assessment, start out with their maintenance equipment lists. So that could be their inventory in Excel, it could be from their maintenance management system, but we can take that list out on site with us. We're looking at name plates and documenting site conditions already. Uh, we can actually then provide more value by maybe validating some of that information and giving that back to the client as enhanced documentation uh, that they can integrate with their software, their, their uh, maintenance management system. I think the role of training too goes beyond what the traditional commissioning process has always looked at for training. Um, really in this pandemic era, it's even more important to make sure that the client is on site with you uh, as much as possible. In, with this campus project, we had the client's facility team pretty much shadowing us day by day as we were walking through these buildings uh, to understand what risks we were finding and how we were reporting these so that they could better report that up to their boss, bosses and bosses' bosses. Um, and then finally, I just want to highlight making sure this all ties back to that OPR CFR conversation. So after you implement that commissioning approach, whether it's new building or existing building, making sure to revisit that OPR CFR document. Uh, with this campus example, we ended up finding that they wanted to pursue MERV 13 filtration, but MERV 13 filters, as many of you know, are eight, nine, 10 months out in terms of lead time. So that just isn't feasible for them to get the quantity they need. So looking at other solutions, putting that and redocumenting those expectations in that OPR, and then that can be a tool that communicates up, upwards to those executive level, maybe more of a non-technical audience. Uh, these next couple of slides, just wanted to show a couple of examples of some of the checklists that can be useful. I know, again, we have an audience here that may have already created their own libraries. Um, if you haven't, these are some good examples that you can look at. Uh, a filtration pre-assessment, you know, typically not a checklist we would have had in non-pandemic times. Uh, perhaps, but now filtration takes a front stage, uh, front and center with uh, our, uh, what we're looking at. The next slide shows a filtration functional performance test um, where we're looking at what values we want to, again, get maybe that commissioning tech junior level engineer to record. Uh, again, I highly recommend if you can uh, utilize a test and balance contractor to get some of these motor amperages. So you start to know the capacities, the limits of your system, and maybe what filtration efficiencies you can uh, increase in these air handling units um, is, is very useful information. The chart we have here, currently we're doing um, about 50 million square feet across an entire school system of doing the filter changes. So what we've done is we've just simply developed a basic spreadsheet to automatically tell you what the new MERV filter can be. Often you're going to, so the way the design engineer does it, they're gonna calculate a static pressure, then they're going to follow the fan curve, they're going to figure out the motor horsepower, let's just say it's seven horsepower, then we round up to the next frame size at 10. So most of the time, the uh, horsepower, the fan motors, we have some spare capacity. So you can theoretically do this immediately. And then as you start to see some degradation in the performance, you can go back to the previous filter size. But 
These are pretty straightforward um, calculations to run. And then you can uh, know which type of filter. So we are putting in anything uh, from MERV. Uh, and we'll go up a couple MERV sizes and try to reach that MERV 13. So just create a kind of a basic uh, filter motor change. One thing I'm also finding is help educate your clients on filters. A MERV 6 plus a MERV 7 does not equal a MERV 13. So that was a, a exciting question I was able to get. So also, right. go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Good. Looking at ventilation rates, um, this may or may not be appropriate to the type of client you're serving. But we wanted to show this slide because sometimes, you know, we've all been there where you get the 1980s uh, blueprints and your or floor plans and you're walking through the building and you realize that all of these spaces have changed function. Um, so in some cases, you know, we may need to go deeper. And again, our, as our role as practitioners, uh, this is bringing up new questions here in this pandemic era. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, looking at space usage and those required minimum airflow rates is warranted in certain cases. Uh, and then finally, looking at demand control ventilation, I, I think a lot of people have heard the guidance here of disabling your demand control ventilation, making sure we can adjust that set point as low as possible so that demand control ventilation will in effect not kick in. Um, but you know, also a few other things you can look at is this, if you're monitoring CO2 level in the space, that can actually be a pretty good indicator of your ventilation effectiveness, the effectiveness of your HVAC system, maybe in purging uh, CO2 from the space. Um, if you are monitoring other pollutants, maybe VOCs, we'll show some examples of that later. Um, these sensors can be tools. So, you know, thinking beyond maybe just disabling demand control ventilation and looking at uh, you know, using that information coming in for different purposes. So with the one thing I want to add here is the new guidance from ASHRAE is going to adjust some of the disabling of the demand control ventilation when there is a block load type scenario. So if you have a classroom corridor in a gym, if you disable it, then the gym might suck in all the fresh air. So that the new guidance is going to be having you look at the way the DOAS's were designed and to make sure that you might have a higher set point on let's say a gym if the gym is not going to be used and it's on the same DOAS then that one might go to a higher uh, CO2. So as you start to look at your design scenarios um, 800 and disabling it is the starting point unless it's on a kind of a block load um, scenario. What we've also created, this is just a typical school we've done um, as part of that is we start looking at the air change rates. If you remember originally, we are trying to target that six. The path that most of the clients have started to go quickly is buying these portable units. We are then looking at different stages of either running a assembly area or gym units in full 100% fresh air to drive that ventilation um, into the rest of the spaces. We do have to be wary of transfer air and still meet code, but with some of the conference rooms, some of the auditoriums, assembly spaces, that's our best mode of getting fresh air into the space. So as you start to create your functional performance test, you have to step back uh, one step to a hierarchy level and look at the building holistically and not just each unit. I think often we've been too focused on a singular unit and see how the building will perform from a ventilation criteria uh, holistically. So that's gonna be another FPT you should be thinking about. These are just some sample sequences. Um, Mike, you wanna just go over a couple then I can finish it off? Yeah. And so I, I saw a question too asking about um, what type of sequences of operation and changes have we seen. Um, it's certainly a purge mode, you know, looking at um, purging the spaces. I've seen two hours before occupancy um, being utilized. Uh, we're working on some commissioning projects right now that are a new construction, but yet they're still in the design phase uh, with healthcare facilities, looking at that, um, if we can get kind of that protective environment and airborne infection isolation 
uh, to be a more of an ambidextrous room um, where maybe there's bypass stampers implemented, different fans, um, essentially investing in the capital infrastructure, right, to think about that next pandemic. So I am seeing that uh, being taken uh, in effect. Uh, we also have seen uh, like a higher ed client where you might have a mixed kind of use building. So maybe most of the building is classroom, part of it's admin uh, space. And right now with the pandemic, we're trying to find that balance between energy and safety. So looking at what is the best sequence there in this particular example, uh, they actually had the ox sensors tied into the HVAC so we could use those occupancy sensors to kind of drive those zone ventilation rates, uh, making sure that, you know, once that zone uh, is unoccupied, so maybe the class is done, that that still stays occupied for at least an hour afterwards as kind of a purge mode at probably your max cooling rate um, so that we're getting that, that room ready for the next uh, set of occupants. So we're seeing some of that um, be effective here. And then, you know, with the occupancy sensors, now, you know, we still are able to implement those static pressure resets. Some of those energy, energy saving um, methodologies and sequences can stay in place because it's a little bit more controlling the building based on the occupancy and uh, trying to find that balance between safety and energy use. So going through the three sequences that you see here, um, and then I'm gonna add a fourth one. On the air handling unit flushing, if your building operators are gonna open windows, make sure that that is also taken into consideration. And as soon as the windows do open, then the air handlers should go into economizer mode. So that way you're not uh, going to overcool or overheat and waste energy. So that's one. So just think about that. I know New York City schools, that is the MO, open the windows. Heating coil sanitation. There are several studies out there similar to Legionnaire's disease that once you hit about 150 degrees, it does kill all biological life forms. Uh, we are running a heating coil sanitation cycle at 1 a.m. where the fan is off and we're just heating up the air handling casing. Most filters can take up to 180 degrees of heat, so we don't see any degradation. The only worry may be some wiring, but that shouldn't be a problem. So the goal is to try to kill everything in that casing is one more level of sanitation. On the air filtration motor loading, um, if you just have a VFD, you might be able to pull those numbers just to see in actuality whether a MERV 13 is going to hurt or harm. We've seen enough uh, operations where fil dirty filters, when they're loaded up, do run similar to a MERV-13. Um, we are not saying to have more filter changes. So those are things to think about. And then again, go deeper into the demand control ventilation based on how the design was done with the, DO the DOAZs and where that is. The goal now for you as practitioners is use the tools that are in place most of the new designs are going to be uh, updated, but it's now about how you use your existing sensors to start improving your indoor air quality. So what are some of the upcoming techs and trends? So on one of the, um, on that large project that we're doing for every school, we are putting in the following single sensor for temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, parts per million, and VOCs. So what we're seeing now as the data starts to come in is when our parts per million at the 2.5 and at the 10, as we start getting readings, that is telling us that our filtration is working. We typically put 10 to 20 sensors in on a 60,000 square foot school, and we're gonna start moving them around um, every week just to see if we've got some, if we have good distribution. So that's one way to see if your filters are actually filtering. No differential pressure. It's not about changing the filters. It's seeing if they're picking up the particulate. CO2. So when our carbon dioxide levels inside reach the same as outside, it is an indirect correlation that we have good dilution. And so now we're going to get the number of how long to run the ventilation during the after occupied. It may be one hour, it may be two, it may be three to start to make sure we flush it. Distribution is going to be your challenge. The VOCs has been a really interesting one. So what we're seeing is when 
customers start to sanitize and also fog the rooms. The VOCs are spiking and it's for a short time as the HVAC starts to uh, clear that out. So the way that our customers are using that VOC monitor is basically proving to the occupants that the room was sanitized the night before or between classes. So again, we are in a point where we have to prove um, versus um, we are going to be held accountable. So this is kind of a typical layout of how that would look um, on a hospital. And so we start to put these green means good and then red means let's start to investigate and see which one of those uh, issues are there. So hopefully you've learned something and you've got some nice tools and we are now going to open it up for questions. My email is there, Mike's email is there. I am uh, posting a lot of this information on LinkedIn. So I'd be happy to um, join me on LinkedIn and we're ready for questions. Okay. Thank you, Raj and Mike. Let's open it up to questions now. Anyone that has one coming in, please submit them to the Q&A button. This first one I wanted to address is, what are the recommended safety protocols for maintenance swapping out dirty filters that have captured the COVID-19 virus? Okay, that's a great question. If you take anything away from this presentation is make sure that all your maintenance personnel are wearing PPE. There is a University of Oregon study that has shown that the virus did lodge into uh, pre-filters and final filters. So as far as maintenance goes, it's already in the air. I would wear gloves. I would go ahead and wear masks and goggles and then I would bag it separately and spray that bag down with bleach. You can follow OSHA protocols for disposal of the filters and then please make sure that you have a separated waste stream for your biological um, waste such as filters, masks, um, gloves, sneezes, whatever it is, tissues and then that should go separately to keep your other PPE clean. But since it's already theoretically in the air, we're more of an indoor air quality. Um, so just use your normal sanitation protocols. This is another reason we like that heating sanitation cycle. So hopefully it'll kill everything in that casing. I'd also Good. add, you know, some of the other recommendations are to, there's a, there's a number of products out there that you can have your maintenance folks spray on the filters um, as they're coming out. Again, making sure they're wearing that PPE because you know, there, is, there are studies showing the risk of that virus re uh, becoming airborne, and then that becomes a threat to your uh, maintenance facility staff. Okay, next question. Great. Um, so there's two questions on UVC and then UV, so I'm going to ask them together. Has anyone tested the efficacy of UVC on the destruct uh, destruction of coronavirus? And... Uh, this one person said that they've heard that UV filters have limited effect for COVID, air speed too fast. Please discuss further the evidence that UV can be an effective tool with COVID. All right, so on UV and all UVC, UVC, most of the published data and studies are on mold and the biologicals that it's been used for years to clean coil. So we do know that it does have a detrimental effect on um, mold. UVC in itself does not actually kill the virus, but what it does is stops the replication. So your half-life of the virus starts to drop. So that's what you're going to start to hear, like, well, it doesn't really kill. Well, correct, it stops the replication. Second, you have two levers when you design UVC. You have the light intensity. You need to be between anywhere from 1200 micro microwatts per square centimeter to 4000 microwatts per square centimeter and the airspeed. If you start to have higher air speeds, then you have to increase your intensity or go with a reflective um, coating inside where those are going to be used. We're doing about two and a half million square feet for a governmental agency putting in UVCs now. And every air handler has a unique situation where we are putting in different intensities of that. You can also put it in on the return side you can put it in the supply side, you can put it in near the coil. So it is about exposure time and speed. 
and it does stop the replication. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, another person's question slash comment is, in short term, more energy will be consumed. They've seen presentations and discussions about future design changes for virus mitigation. Can you discuss how any collaboration has been occurring with the diametrically opposed concepts of more outside air and the energy goals of, say, 2030? Mike, why don't you start this one? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. I, I think the bottom line is it's still a little bit up in the air, right, with what, how these goals are going to be met. Um, we've worked with some clients in Texas about trying to achieve the 2030 goal. And, you know, in some cases, you know, um, that may not be, you know, achievable. I talked to a higher ed client um, with a, a fairly large campus and he said, you know, this moving their outdoor air damper from 20% to 40% was going to cost an extra $500,000 uh, in costs. So this is where as commissioning professionals, we've got to be thinking creatively. I don't think there's any one you know magic bullet here but the way where i have seen this work well um, has been like i mentioned earlier in that using occupancy sensors to try to uh, make sure that we're you know flushing and purging when we see occupancy um, but yet when we're not seeing that occupancy we don't need to be running that much air maybe if that whole zone is unoccupied you know and we can we can monitor that with the occupancy sensors then utilizing those same energy efficiency strategies that we're familiar with, you know, static pressure resets, things like that. So it's really about the capacity of the system, I think, and, and trying to incorporate some of those energy savings techniques that we all know uh, so well. What, um, what you need to also think about is there's 87, 60 hours in a year. Think about what you can do with the unoccupied hours during this pandemic mode. Think about um, altering your temperature resets. We are changing some of our supply temperatures and um, return air, looking at that. Maybe you just start, instead of going from fresh air and neutral and unoccupied, you might bump it up or bump it down based on the season. Focus on energy savings during unoccupied. We do not have a lot of levers at this point during occupied as long as the vaccine has not come out. Everything you're doing is temporary at this point. So I think do no harm, you were in it, but be able to take all this away once the operators and their legal counsel says, okay, back to normal operation. All right, next question. Can you get into the needle point technology and its effectiveness? Uh, so the bipolar ionization is very similar. Actually, I think it's identical to the corona discharge. You're electrifying the airstream and giving the particulate a charge. So then two things can ha happen. The particulate can attach to each other, which is called agglomeration. And so now the particle size might not be 10 microns, but might be 20, 30. So then your existing filters can catch it. The other uh, technology out there similar to the bipolar is that it uh, electrifies the filter as well as the particles and then they adhere to each other magnetically. When you have very small terminal units, window units, PTACs, um, this technology where you can't change the filter, you have to start looking at making your filters more effective. So that's how in a nutshell these guys work. There's very few moving parts. They, the literature says that it's 10 to 15 years. Um, again, ASHRAE does not, uh, we don't have good peer reviewed studies yet, they're coming out, but from what I've seen from the manufacturers, we're deploying it. Um, that's my personal company recommendation. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. I think where we're seeing it too is it, you know, I showed the slide with the risk assessment, you know, color coding spaces and looking at where are the high risk spaces which are tend, tend to be the spaces that communicate with the public, right? So it could be a lobby um, where a COVID positive patient could walk in. Uh, I think some of those spaces, we need to look at the needle point technology as an effective solution, uh, along with the other solutions that are out there and we, that ASHRAE is actually um, encouraging us to look at. So going back to, does it work? 
all of these technologies, you just got to test for the parts per million that eventually hit the space in the 2.5 or 10 micron level. Then you'll know. A lot of our clients, we are doing a singular mock-up classroom, office space, dorm room, and then we can see which technology works. And that's kind of the middle ground before you go do 10,000 dorm rooms. Just do a couple monitor that's where commissioning agents come in see what's making it through the filtration system then you can make your own decision on ramping it up next question is there one quick and inexpensive mitigation recommendation we can provide to our small unsophisticated clients as a balancing contractor I would say, number one, get your fresh air maximized. So what's the best place to be is outside. So figure out as a balancing contractor how much fresh air you can actually bring in, the real number, not just what's off the drawing, and then push it. Go as much as you can when you're non-peak. It's going to be a fairly standard correlation. So bring in more fresh air and then singularly change the filter. Those are two very low cost they're gonna have operational impacts, but they don't have any capital costs. Yeah, I would, I'd also encourage to look at some of the resources that are readily available. There's actually a, an ASHRAE healthcare uh, COVID guidance documents on ASHRAE's website right now. And it's, it's got some great guidance on kind of a layered approach, providing a variety of options for the healthcare environment, but these certainly could be applied to other environments, you know, looking at, some of the really simple solutions of portable HEPA filtration units, you know, even putting fans in the windows. I think that's, that's when we're talking about an incremental scaled approach in terms of the commissioning approach. Um, as long as the client is aware that that's the approach we're taking, we're not gonna solve everything maybe on the first phase, uh, then that should be a, a great way to manage those expectations, utilize some of this guidance that's coming out from some of these industry partners Good. Next question. Having used uh, CFD modeling in the past, I'm concerned that we now have uneducated people calling for, quote, adequate ventilation in schools and public buildings. Is there a set description of adequate ventilation and what is this? And they wrote 2H, uh, 2ACH, 6, 10, ceiling air supply, and floor level return, like an operating room. Well, if you do want to do a CFD on a classroom that is going to give you your best um, guidance on distribution. If you do supply high, return low, that, start, that is going to pick up uh, more of the distribution versus supply high, return high. So NIST has a Fatima tool, which is the fate, the particulate fate that you can plug in and you can start seeing what dies and what lives based on your ventilation and your distribution. That's one place. It's kind of a light CFD modeling. The more air changes, the better. You can also start, and I like to say a minimum of six, and then you move up from there. You can also define air changes, and ASHRAE does this in a very vague way, and we're trying to get better about that, as air rotations also. So it's not just simply about fresh air, it is also how many times can you rotate the air through a filter. And the portable units um, are a good low cost way. You can get portable units for around three to $400 that will do three to 400 square feet. And you can run those things and they have UVC and HEPA. We just finished buying almost 5,000 of them for a school district and we're gonna stick one in every classroom. So that was a it's expensive when you multiply, but it is a low cost because there's very little labor. They just plug in, there's no condensate. It's not cooling, it's just a dumb fan with a big filter on it. So hopefully that answers. I would say look at the six air changes, look at your distribution and start with that point with the CFD model. And I'd also add, just looking at, are we talking about air changes within the room, maybe through fil added filtration in that room. You know, th this is again, kind of that fan coil unit uh, look, or are we talking about outdoor air changes? And you know, the example I gave with this uh, large campus client, it was really about getting to three outdoor air changes. Um, and they felt like that, 
that would provide them with the safety. A lot of this is also, you know, again, driven by our client expectations um, in terms of what they're comfortable with. And that was what they determined. We found that most of the equipment actually could handle that. There was maybe minimal comfort issues could come in uh, due to the coil sizing at design days. But you know, you're looking at a very small percentage of time for that. And as long as the client is educated, um, you know, and knows that's a risk, uh, you know, I'd recommend looking at that also. Okay, thank you, Mike and Raj. We are at the top of the hour, so we are out of time for more questions. I just wanna close things out by thanking the presenters once again and everyone who joined us, including our members across all three affiliated organizations. We're happy to have this ongoing opportunity to virtually connect during these social distancing times. Uh, just a reminder to everyone participating today, you should keep an eye out for an email with information regarding your learning units from the ACG CX Energy app. And while in your app, this app, I suggest that everyone please take a moment to evaluate this presentation. We will be continuing our webinar series next month, November 12th, with hyperscale data center commissioning and construction. And also, please be sure to mark your calendars for CX Energy 2021 in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Have a wonderful day and stay healthy, everyone.